So think about when you get a cut on your hand. Okay, so when you get a cut, typically there'll be bacteria that gets inside that cut. And so maybe you put some Neosporin on it, uh, maybe a Band-Aid, uh, maybe it gets a little bit of inflamed. If it's inflamed, that means your immune system is working. Maybe you get a little bit of pus, which means that your immune system again is working because that's where pus comes from, and then it goes away. We would just consider that an infection and not that you are diseased, okay? So what if, however, you get cut? Uh, say you're out, you know, crabbing, and you get cut on one of the crab spines, and then, uh, you know, a day or two later, you've got sweats, your hand is, is black, right, and you go into sepsis. Well, clearly, that infection went to the disease state very rapidly. And some bacteria can do that. As a matter of fact, one of the bacteria that me and my students work with here on campus at JU, uh, Vibrio vulnificus, can, that happens to people, right? They, they, it gets disseminated. So what makes an organism capable of, after it gets into your cut, getting into your system, disseminating through your body, evading your immune system, right? And then, in the cases where it's applicable, for that person to then infect somebody else. Okay. In the case of Vibrio vulnificus, the infection stops with that person typically, but there's a lot of other diseases we'll, care, we'll consider that that's not the case. Okay, so in this case, disease is only right, if it alters the normal functions of the body. Okay, so just a cut where you've got a little bit of inflammation, that is considered an infection right, and not disease state. Okay? And when you're disease, that's also called morbidity. And one of the exercises we'll look at in this, this class is looking at the morbidity and mortality weekly reports from the CDC. So back to this image on the five stages uh, of many infectious diseases, right, where we go from the incubation period, where if you look at the y-axis, there's hardly any number of microorganisms, and there's no signs or symptoms, right, uh, through the prodromal and illness. So what's going on for the microbe to be able to go all the way to very high numbers and get you sick? Well, some key terms to consider are invasion, adhesion, evasion, and dissemination. Okay? So each one, the ability for each microbe to carry this out, right? So in case of entry, in case of the cut, well, that means that, that they didn't cause the cut, but once they're there, how can they gain entry into your bloodstream or into your, your, uh, your extracellular fluids, right? And then when they're there, often microbes will adhere to something. They'll either stick to something to hide, or they will bind to something. So this is supposed to be a, a protein sticking on the outside. They'll bind to something like a, a, a key in a lock, and that will allow entry into a cell. And then there's evasion. How is it that certain microbes can evade the immune system, right? Other, some microbes, your, your immune system will clear out very, very rapidly. Others evade your immune system. Very, very tricky. And dissemination. How can it disseminate throughout the body, right? Some bacteria can, can essentially fill up your bloodstream, right? Others cannot. So to be able to do all of this, Different types of bacteria, different types of viruses, different type of fungi, they all have different complements of virulence factors. So virulence factor is a general term that means some type of protein, some type of metabolic capability, some feature that is encoded for in its genome that allows it to essentially be an infectious agent. Okay, so virulence factors. So for adhesion, okay, what we have here is a good example of essentially, uh, we've got a, a drawing of a microbe, and in this case, a bacterium, okay? And so in this particular case, you know, everything's totally not to scale, right? So this is just for illustration. You see these little, little W things sticking out. Well, that is a ligand, and what it is it binding to? It's binding to some type of a receptor in the host cell. So this is the cell membrane, and then in it there's a protein which has this particular sugar molecule. Uh, in the case of influenza, we're talking about for, well, it has a sugar molecule, carbohydrate, and then this micro binds to it. Once it binds, it can stick there, okay? Or maybe it goes into the cell. And so in this particular case, what we're looking at is uh, over here, we're looking at an individual cell, which is the white part, a bacterial cell, 
And then if you look at this black stuff around it, that is just a staining technique that is showing that something is there. And in this case, it is, it is like a capsule, okay? Uh, so being able to adhere is really important. So typically in bacteria, we're talking about proteins and sugars that are on the outside. So if I'm a bacteria, I've got things sticking off of me, proteins or sugars, which can do things non-specifically or can bind very, very specifically. Okay, sometimes I'll be completely coated. Uh, viruses, pretty much there's proteins that are sticking out, uh, which will bind to specific receptors, which allow it to gain entry to the cell. And parasitic worms, they often have hooks on them. And so in this case, I, this is a picture from a scanning electron microscope. That's what this SEM means. And if we look at this size, three microns is about... Uh, the size of, ooh, look at that, my pointer is so small, it's now three micrometers. Uh, so this is under a microscope, so if you look up at this, if we look at right here, these are two cells right next to it that are in the process of dividing, and together they're about two microns. And so that goes back to the idea of understanding, by looking at that, you should tell me what type of microorganism is that. Is it a virus, is it a bacteria, or is it a eukaryote? Right? So just based on, ah, well, if that's three micrometers, and I look at these particular things, each one of those looks like it's maybe one micrometer, then that should clue you in that looks like it's a bacterium. Plus, after you go through the course more, you'll just look at that picture and be like, that's definitely a bacterium. And most of you are probably looking at that right now saying, Dr. Willett, that's certainly a bacterium, in which case, right on. Okay? So what we're looking at then is, um, again, there's, there's a ligand. Right? Some of them will have proteins that bind, and that's what we're showing, again, in this same image up here. For biofilms, right, so if you're, if you're flossing your teeth, right, and you're pulling out goopy stuff, right, because it builds up, right, uh, the stuff that is goopy in your mouth that you clean off when you're brushing, that's a biofilm. And so the reason it's goopy is because of those are carbohydrates that are made by bacteria so that they can stick to your teeth, so that they can stick to your gums. So if I'm a bacterium, right, and then I divide, and then there's two of me, so I think there's another one over there, and then there's another one, three. If we are at the same time coating ourselves, that is secreting sugars to form this carbohydrate slime layer or capsule around us, then we're sticky, right? Sugar solutions are sticky, same idea. Then we can not only stick to something, and when you're chewing and swallowing and drinking, and you're drinking a soda, and the sugar's going by, we're in this biofilm, and the sugar can get absorbed by the biofilm, and we can take that sugar, for example. Okay? Uh, or, and the other thing it does is it's, it's protection. And so some antibiotics can't get through biofilms. And so biofilms, right, that are formed by mainly carbohydrates, but there's also proteins and nucleic acids, are a very important part. So when uh, a, uh, you know, a catheter right, uh, leads to infection, that typically means that there's a biofilm on there. For um, artificial joints, when there's infection all over it, that means that there's a biofilm of bacteria growing on that. So adhesion is a very important part of the strategy that bacteria in particular employ to hang around in your system once it gets in and not get caught up by the immune system. It also can hide the bacteria from the immune system because now they've got this carbohydrate layer. More on that with specific examples throughout the course. Okay? So you do not need to know all of the specifics on this slide. Okay? But what I want you to do is take a look at this with me. Okay? So adhesins, we've already covered that. And then for motility, some bacteria have flagella. Okay? And that allows them to do what? That allows them to swim. Okay, so if you're a bacterium and you can swim in liquid media, that means you can get further, right? And you can go somewhere. And bacteria, they may look simple, but they can be very complex. So uh, bacteria, if they increase, uh, if they encounter dissolved sugars or amino acids or proteins, right, in your bloodstream or in some type of uh, tissue, then they can sense the concentration and they will swim upstream into the higher concentration of these molecules because for them, molecules are food. They're individual cells, so they bring in molecules, right? They don't have teeth, they're not munching on stuff. And so the ability to swim up a concentration gradient and then be all set where you've just got all these different types of uh, uh, nutrients that you can absorb into your cell, that's clearly a good reason for that, okay? So uh, extracellular enzymes, just understand that a lot of these extracellular enzymes, okay, 
what they do is they allow you to, uh, they allow the bacterium to break down different components. So if we look at this, degrades collagen, degrades hyaluronic acid, degrades red blood cells. Now there are different reasons for each one. You do not need to know these right now, but just to give you an idea, if you can degrade collagen, that's nutrients, plus it allows you to disseminate through the body. If you can break down red blood cells, that means you can get the iron from it, right? So different proteins, different exoenzymes have different strategies, okay? Um, this particular uh, coagulase will clot blood around a bacterium and thereby uh, make it look like it's part of the individual, right? If we now have clotted blood around it, then it looks like it's part of the organism. So what you should know about extracellular enzymes is that bacteria release them to do things like break things down for nutrients or to make things uh, go around them to hide. Those are the mainly the things that you need. Others, particular toxins, uh, cytotoxins kill host cells, they interfere with nerve functions. Uh, exotoxins, the things you should know about that is they release them from the cell and they, they're, they're toxic. They break down cells or they interfere with things. Okay. Endotoxins, we'll talk more about when we're talking about cellular structure and we're talking about gram staining. And then there's antiphagocytic factors. Uh, I've mentioned capsules now a couple times and I've already explained this, right? Even though we didn't talk about phagocytosis, being covered in a, uh, a, a carbohydrate capsule means that you, the proteins and sugars that are on the surface of, of you as a bacterium are not exposed to the immune system. Okay, so if there's a white blood cell marauding around looking for particular pathogens and they just come across this capsule which is a sugar layer, they may not, that cell may not recognize it and so that's a way to lurk around. You can think of the capsule in this particular instance as a type of cloak of invisibility, right? It hides you from the immune system. Whereas capsules also in the other example is like a cloak of stickability maybe, right? It allows you to stick to things. So in other words, capsules are great for bacteria. So okay, uh, signs and symptoms, we've already talked about that in terms of going from the prodromal stage, right, where you have uh, signs and symptoms that are more general and more vague, and then when you're actively sick and ill, right, then they're, they're ramped up. So uh, I'm guessing that most or all of you already know this, but signs are objective. Signs is if you were to take somebody's temperature and you see that it is high. Right? Signs is if you feel them and that they are cold or they've got an irregular heartbeat. Something that is objective that anybody can say, yes, you have that. Subjective is, oh, I feel tired. Right? So these are the subjective things um, uh, that, are, that are symptoms. You know, I've got cramps, I've got itching. We cannot verify that by looking at you. You're scratching, but we can't really know that you're itching, right? except for you telling us. Okay? So syndrome. Right, so what is a, a common disease that has syndrome in the name? Right, AIDS, right, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. And so it's, the reason it's a syndrome is that AIDS is after you've gotten HIV infected and it's racked your body and depleted your immune system so much that you are getting infected by a lot of, by opportunistic organisms. And so basically this group of signs and symptoms, in that case it could be a low T cell count plus getting a weird infection by a microorganism that normally a healthy person wouldn't, right? So a syndrome is a group. And asymptomatic uh, is essentially, right, well, you know what that means. So I don't need to go into that. Um, so let's go a little bit more into the microbiology. Uh, and that is, okay, so somebody's sick, they're, they're, they've got you know, signs and symptoms. How do we know what is causing the disease? Well, as nurses, you know there's certain things that you do that you can start ruling it right out, right? Uh, for example, even just cold and flu, right? If somebody comes in, if somebody, if they're like, oh, I've got a cold, but they've got a temperature, right? And they're, they're, their body aches a lot, then you know that's, pro that's flu. That's not, uh, that's not a cold, right? Now, you don't really know if it's a flu unless you did tests, but you, you got a pretty good, um, pretty good diagnosis there. But if we go back to just hardcore microbiology, and that is, okay, what is the disease agent that is causing this person to get sick? Um, we're looking for the etiology. Okay, so one thing about this course, it is for you as nurses, right? However, it is not a nursing course. And so while we will mix in some nursing components, you know, I'm certainly not a nurse, right? I'm a PhD, I'm a microbiologist. Uh, 
The purpose of this class is to focus on the microbiology of diseases. Now, we will get into epidemiology, we will get into things, but a lot of the nursing stuff that you will naturally gravitate towards in this class are really not covered, okay? So in this case, um, the germ theory of disease, which goes back, way back to the 1800s, is that diseases are caused by infections of pathogenic organisms. And in the 1800s, that's when the first instance of showing that a microorganism actually causes diseases. Before then, you know, it was bad air. It was, you know, God is angry at us. Those are the types of things that people thought caused infectious diseases. Right? Now we know better, but it's only because of pioneering microbiologists in the 1800s in the so-called golden age of microbiology that really discovered this. So we went, we, uh, a big cloak was pulled off of us. So Koch, Robert Koch, his postulates are an important thing for us to go over uh, really in any microbiology class because although we don't really use it as much these days, and you'll see why, it was tremendous in first showing scientifically what causes certain types of diseases. So there are four Koch's postulates, okay? And that is, okay, we're talking about an infected organism, whether it's an animal or a person, right? And so to then determine the etiology, that is the cause of the disease, uh, what we do is we go ahead and say, so, so poor mouse, right? In this case, this was probably a lab mouse. So poor mouse um, was infected. And so what you need to be able to do is you need to be able to, uh, if you look at all of the cases of mice that have this disease, right, that, that same germ, which is a general term for a microorganism, okay, that germ must be present in every instance of the disease, okay? And it should not be found in the healthy individuals, right? So say you've got 100 people, 40 of them are ill with this sickness, 60 of them are not, you should be able to get that disease agent out of the ones that are sick, and that disease agent should not be in the ones that are healthy, okay? That's the general Koch's postulates. Then you must be able to take it out, and you, may be, you must be able to culture in the lab. So look, we think we've got it, we're growing it, right? And then, <laughs> this is kind of a sad part, right? And then you need to show that this, what you've taken off of that Petri dish in this case, you can then infect another organism and they will get the same disease and you can then pull that same microbe out which you found up there. Okay, so the, the, the infectious agent, the germ must be in all cases of diseased and not in healthy cases. You must be able to grow it in a lab. You must be able to take that in fact, any organism you infect with it should get that disease, and then you should be able to pull that same microorganism out. Those are Koch's postulates, and that's how the microbiologists in the 1800s showed, for example, uh, that anthrax, that Bacillus anthracis, was the causative agent of anthrax. And that is the first disease that was shown to be caused by a microorganism. Okay, so, so no Koch's postulates. It's a, it's, it's a good set of, of, of steps to know about, okay? However, you know, nowadays we know that that is very simplistic, but back in the day they were, they were breaking ground, right? So for example, some can't be cultured in the, in the laboratory, okay? So, so some microorganisms, we just don't know how to culture yet. So there you go. Uh, some diseases are caused by a combination of pathogens. So, you know, if there's more than one, then that violates Koch's hypostulates. Ethical considerations, so what are you gonna do? Infect a human now that, you've, now that you've pulled it out? Nowadays, no. Back in the day, yes, okay? So, uh, and also, um, some diseases can be caused by more than one pathogen, okay? So you may have some type of infection that some is caused by pathogen A in one, or in one person and pathogen B in another organism. And so in that case, it also breaks down. And of course, there are diseases which do not apply, these are only infectious diseases, right? 